Living History, World War II Stories is told by those who were there. And today we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of a B-17 bombardier in the 8th Air Force. Lieutenant Joe Strauss was a B-17 bombardier with a 100th Bomb Group flying combat missions high in the skies over Europe. Brooke, uh, why was the bombardier so important? Uh, Dave, uh, uh, precision daylight bombing was vital to the war effort and uh, depended uh, heavily on the skill and the courage of, of a, a bombardier under fire using a Norden bomb sight. Like this one here, Brooke? Exactly. Triangular shapes were the first air division, which were all B-17s. The second air division in, in the 8th Air Force uh, was the, were all B-24s, and the third air division were all squares. A, B, C, D, yeah, we were square Ds, etc. There were only three divisions in the 8th Air Force as far as heavy bombardment was concerned. My position was right here, and I had the best best view of the whole thing, good, bad, or indifferent, whether it was bloody or, or a Fitzpatrick travel log, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I had the view. The turret is operated by two pistol grip uh, releases, but it's over to the side. There's a foot pedal uh, under attack. You'd hit that, and the gun sight fell. It came right in front of you, oh. and uh, you just grabbed on, and the sighting was above it. Uh, and but uh, other than that, it was to the side, so it wouldn't interfere with your operation of the Norden bomb sight. Or uh, missions took anywhere from eight to ten hours uh, of actual flying time. But for usually ten minutes or so, from when the bombardier took over the actual flight of the aircraft. Norton bomb site was hooked up to the C-1 autopilot when it was engaged, and the corrections you would put in into the bomb site at a fixed altitude, which was maintained by the pilot when he set the uh, C-1 autopilot up, were correcting for drift and airspeed. For that 10 minutes from the end, what they call the initial point, the IP point, the bomb site is flying the aircraft, and the only, the only difference in the attitude of the airplane is what correction the bomb is putting in to freeze the target hairs in the bomb site on the target. Uh, the uh, bomb site was an early form of a computer. We never referred to it as that. And this is going back, and that bomb site was developed, I believe, something like 1930, uh, late 30s. It was actually conceived, uh, and we never thought of it as a computer. Bomb site computing all the time as you're closing in on the target, release the bombs electronically from that imaginary spot in the sky. And uh, the rest of the aircraft. If in our group, we would have 36 planes up, three squadrons of 12 each, lead high and low. And of 36 planes, there's probably only six bombardiers. The rest, uh, there's somebody sitting in the front up there, but he is a toggle there. He's an enlisted man, and you've heard that before. He would release the bombs manually uh, from a switch on the control panel to the left of the bombardier, which I had the same ability to do the same thing too if I didn't if I wasn't operating a bomb site when the lead bombardier of that squadron would release. We would be flying lead high low uh, as close as we could until you hit the IP point. Then you fan out. We weren't too worried about uh, fighter attack at that time because once we fanned out we knew we would be subject to any aircraft fire and the enemy didn't want to get shot down by their own anti-aircraft guns. So, and when, as soon as we released the bombs, we would then regain our protective uh, flying position, meaning as, get as close together as a group. The three squadrons lead high and low. The bombs would go. You'd, you'd feel, you'd feel uh, a surge because you'd go up 500 feet right away when the bombs went because we've lost 6,000 pounds. And then we'd peel off as fast as we could and had to get out of the... Uh, attacking range of the anti-aircraft uh, bursts and uh, regroup and uh, go uh, fly back home. So December 24th, I was, we arrived at the 100th Bomb Group, assigned to the 351st Squadron. Uh, the name of the base was Thorpe Abbotts, and the closest whistle stop town was called DISS, D-I-S-S, and that was in East Anglia. It, it, was, it was known as the Bloody 100th because they had sustained very heavy losses. Um, we, and when you get assigned to a bomber group, you go through seven to ten day training period. It's very involved, very detailed, and very important because you're putting up as much as, and in, in, in the latter part of 44 and early 45, we were putting up as much as, as one to two thousand bombers in a small area. 
uh, as as uh, like the uh, it's hard to describe but say we, we could say between Los Angeles and San Diego and get them up without mid-air collisions to assemble as a, as squadrons groups wings and then divisions and you have three divisions that all get in train and then take off for the continent wherever the target would be it was a, a masterful job of training but and planning but it worked yeah. First mission went to Cologne. I was scared. <laughs> we came back. We didn't have... Uh, frankly, I, I, we completed... We, our crew got credit for 31 missions. Uh, we were briefed for 69. That meant the difference we were scrubbed yeah. because we couldn't fly for whatever the reasons might be. Weather in England, whether over the continent, and, and there's no, the anxiety builds up. And if, whether it be a milk run or a deep penetration, you want to fly and get it over with. It was a, that's my only answer to you. I mean, I re, we were there uh, to, to do a job, and then that was it. That was it. I wanted to get it over as quick as I could. Good, better, and different. And I don't think anybody felt any different about it. And, and, I, mean, I, I wrote myself notes afterward, but I, uh, the, the most... Uh, I, I seem just to give you an idea. Uh, Cologne was the first. Uh, went to Berlin the first time on in uh, January 16th, 1945. No, uh, then we went to uh, Berlin again February 3rd. I got underlined. That must have been a bloody mission where we got took some pretty good losses. Uh, I think I went to Berlin at least six times. Uh, one of the missions, and I think it was uh, in in. Late March, early April, uh, we were under attack for the first time from ME 262s, the German twin engine jets. Uh, fortunate enough, I think this is the most important thing that I can add to the history of this interview is that, from my opinion, the, uh, those jets, they fly at the speed of about 550 miles an hour. P 51 was lucky, they get close to 400 miles. So, therefore, fighter escorts were useless. But because the 8th Air Force or all the air forces combined were so successful in limiting the Germans' ability to produce uh, uh, oil products, uh, petrol, etc., for their aircraft that they can only put these planes up in the sky for about five minutes, ten minutes. They get up in the sun, high above us, we might be at 30,000 feet, 29,000 feet, hide in the sun, and make one pass at the bomber stream. They had 20 millimeter cannons, and all of a sudden, we see this burst in front of us. By the time we got to our guns, they were gone. There was no way. If they were available six months earlier and there was ample fuel to keep them flying, I don't know if I'd be here. I don't think the Eighth Field Force, the war might have been extended another year or two. They were that effective. The Germans were that far ahead of us. I've had aircraft 20 feet away get blown out of the sky. Big orange ball flying right next to me, and bang, it's gone, falling down. Uh, I can't answer that. I can't answer why that aircraft, not us. I can only tell you, uh, you experience, you see it, and you keep going doing what you're doing. I think a better way of explaining, uh, from the IP point on, it, during February or March over Europe, it's about 50, 60 degrees below zero, and we have these electric flying suits, which are no different than an electric blanket, and they work very efficiently. I always disconnected mine. The adrenaline was so high, I didn't need any heat. And, and because from the time of, uh, of the uh, beginning of the, of the bombing run itself, and the IP part, the target, uh, if you're under a fighter attack, you don't have time to think. I mean, it, it's, it's fast. Uh, but from the bomb run, when you know you're sitting duck, the same thing whether a direct burst hits you from uh, any aircraft or a fighter uh, hits the wrong spot, it can cause a plane to blow up and just fall out of the sky. You never think, you, you see it, but you keep going.